everyone. Good morning. And uh, thank you all so much for joining and welcome to Ask the Experts Live, Burden of Disease with Dr. Jonathan Silverberg. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, this session has been made possible with the support of our Eczema Awareness Month sponsors, Sanofi Genzyme and Regeneron, Abby, Water Wipes, Eli Lilly, Baby Dove, Dermavant, and CeraVe. Uh, my name is Wendy smith Bagolka, and I'm the Vice President of Scientific and Clinical Affairs. And today's event is part of Eczema Awareness Month, uh, during which we are encouraging you to get eczema-wise. For more information about Eczema Awareness Month and how you can get involved, please visit eczemaawarenessmonth.org. So today's Q&A is focused on eczema's burden of disease. We'll start with questions that have been pre-sourced from our community and on our social media channels. If you have a question that you would like to ask during this Q&A, please put it into the chat and we will let you know if we're going to be, be able to answer it during the live session today. We also ask uh, that everyone remain on mute during the Q&A to ensure that everyone can hear the answers that Dr. Silverberg will provide for these questions. And then as a reminder, there will be an opportunity tomorrow to connect directly with other members of the community during our virtual talent show, The Itch Factor. For more information, please visit eczemamonth.org and we will also include a link to that in the chat. So now I would like to introduce you to our expert today, Jonathan Silverberg, MD, PhD, MPH. Dr. Silverberg is an Associate Professor of Dermatology at the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences in Washington, DC. He is the Director of Clinical Research and Contact Dermatitis, and his area of clinical subspecialty is inflammatory skin disease, particularly atopic and contact dermatitis, and his research interests include comorbidities and burden of itch and inflammatory skin disease. So Dr. Silverberg, welcome, and thank you so very much for being here with us today. My pleasure to be here. All right, so if you're ready, let's go ahead and get started uh, with some of the questions that we have pre-sourced from our community. And perhaps let's start on the topic of itch and sleep. We know that those are two of the most burdensome symptoms that our community members often report. Um, and one of the questions that we have is, why does my eczema itch so much at night? Um, that sometimes people find it really hard to fall asleep, waking up in the middle of the night. Um, and maybe as you're talking about that, maybe talk about some, maybe some pathways or things people can think about to sleep better at night. Sure. So it, it's actually a, uh, it's a great question. I think it's the one that is uh, the, the, the phenomenon that itch is worse at night is almost universal you know, amongst uh, eczema patients. It's rarely I'll find a patient that says that their itch is the same throughout the day or that their itch is worse in the morning than it is at night. Usually it's that nighttime. So I think it's very relevant to most of the eczema, if not all of the eczema community. Um, and I don't know if the answer is that simple. There, there's a, there is a simple answer and there's a more complex answer. The simple answer is um, that the itch might really be there during the day, but when we're distracted by activities of daily living, school, work, whatever it might be, um, that distraction is enough uh, for us to not really perceive the itch quite as much or to at least be bothered by it quite as much. Um, now, even with that, you know, the more severe the itch, the more, right, the more there's a likelihood of it even breaking through and bothering them during the daytime. Uh, but the thought being that when someone gets home from work and is just relaxing, watching TV, no longer has those distractions, all of a sudden that itch that was perhaps already there becomes more noticeable and sets off that itch scratch cycle. Uh, it turns out it's probably more complicated than that. And there's actually uh, some groups that are working internationally to understand whether or not our itch is regulated by our circadian clocks the way the rest of our body is. We know that, you know, certainly our sleep patterns are regulated by our internal clock. So are our digestive system, you know, when we go to the, to the bathroom, you know, there's all of these things are internally programmed by our circadian rhythms. And there are some that uh, data to suggest that circadian rhythms actually uh, may modulate or, or uh, regulate itch so that when all of the, you know, um, the activity, the hormonal and immune activity shifts that happen in the evening occur, that that drives more itch as well. And it's an area of active inquiry to try to understand exactly why. Um, 
in terms of therapeutics, um, you know, one possible um, approach to addressing that would be the use of something like melatonin to reset circadian rhythms. Now, I wouldn't recommend that for all patients. It would be more specifically for patients who have uh, delayed sleep phase disorders, which is something that's, you know, an advanced concept that really should be dealt with by a sleep medicine specialist. Uh, but there, there, there may be the uh, value of, um, of sort of resetting the circadian clock in order to uh, shift the, uh, you know, the sleep patterns around and to shift around potentially the itch patterns too. So I want to pick up on something you said, Jonathan, about distraction. You know, can di how can distraction techniques help possibly at night as well? Like if you wake up and you can't get back to sleep, um, or possibly even other drugs that have sedating qualities, maybe like a Benadryl, are those, how do those work or do they work? Yeah, so I'll, I'll start with the latter question and then come back to the, the first one. So for Benadryl, there's really only one value for Benadryl, and that's to help people sleep. Um, it has sedating properties. Antihistamines by themselves um, really don't have any known benefit on itch or on inflammation or on skin lesions in atopic dermatitis. They work beautifully for other disorders like hives, and they're one of the main treatments for hives. But for atopic dermatitis, they really have never been shown to do very much efficacy-wise. Now, they are still used very commonly and it's more because they have those sedating properties where for a patient who has a little bit of tougher to control disease, and maybe their topical therapy is not doing the trick, or maybe even a systemic therapy is not doing the trick, and because of that, they're not sleeping well. Uh, so using the antihistamines as a, a sleep medicine, essentially, uh, can be an, a, a reasonable adjunctive approach to help patients sleep better. And it is officially part of our guidelines for only for use for improving sleep in the sedating forms of the antihistamines. But we don't recommend using, in any of the guidelines, antihistamines for itch. Every once in a while, I have a patient who swears that they think they, the, that it's working well for their itch. And if so, then I'll say, okay, well, then it's okay to continue on it. But you know, one of the questions that comes up is, so why should I care? Why can't I use an antihistamine? And there may be, side effects there and things that we haven't even fully um, figured out yet um, that impact the atopic dermatitis community. So I, I don't, you know, my feeling is if we're better off getting tighter control of the underlying inflammation and the underlying itch, and if we do that, then we shouldn't need to, to use even more medicines when it comes to sleep and sedating properties. Um, now, getting back to um, this idea of um, for behavior, either are there behavioral interventions or how does distraction work with respect to um, improving it or at least, you know, you know, making it more bearable. There's actually a lot of different options to think about. There have been approaches like mindfulness techniques and um, even just relaxation therapy um, as ways of trying to sort of calm down some of the anxiety that is provoked by the itch and actually reduce even some of that itch intensity. There's behavioral modifications to try to break the itch scratch cycle because once you start scratching, it's really hard to stop. Um, so, so there's a lot of opportunities there, but you know, we know that itch is a very complex symptom and it, it really, the, the sensation that we feel of itch is driven by pathways that are happening at the level of the skin, at the level of our spinal cords, and at the level of our brain. And we know the inflammation in the skin is driving all that itch. And even when that's there, our brain has the ability to either amplify or decrease the perception of that pain. Like when we're stressed out, pain feels worse. But we're in a good mood and we were calm and we were distracted, our brain has the ability to cool that off at least how much we feel of it. And, and that's real science. That's, you know, there's real pathways to show that. Uh, so you know, I, I definitely encourage patients to think about some of these non-medicated strategies that are low risk. And if we can build them into our routine, you know, sometimes they're labor intensive and hard to do, but if we can build them into our routine, there, there actually can be uh, some pretty good gains from them. 
And then some of the strategies that you're, you've mentioned, Dr. Silverberg, are they you know, equally as effective? Does data show that they work as well in adults as they do in children, or do we, what do we know that way? We're, we're, I think, honestly, in the infancy of this research still, there's so much more that needs to be done. We have you know, a couple of studies here or there vetting, let's say, mindfulness techniques or meditation techniques, and they're all promising, but you know, we don't have you know, 10 well-done large studies that have examined some of these nuances. So I think there's enough evidence there that we can make a recommendation to all patients to at least consider using it. But it's a sophisticated question. Um, we don't have the data really to answer. Sure. And what you were talking about there, that just the complex nature of it, all the different levels of play, maybe some of which are consciously driven, maybe some of which are sort of subconsciously driven. Or, um, you know, we had a question that was about what to do when itch seems like more of a reflex rather than an actual itch sensation. And so does that sort of tie into that kind of way of thinking about it, that there's only certain aspects of itch that might be uh, sort of within our cognitive ability to control and then others have to be managed in a different way? Yeah, so that's a great question. And it's, it's a, I find the wording of the question fascinating in of itself. Um, there, there's no question that itch has um, an enormous component of learned behavior built into it, or at least in terms of how we react to it. Um, I'll, we'll have you know, patients who've itched for a decade or more nonstop with really tough disease. Even when they don't feel itch, you'll find them just doing this, just scratching. And it becomes a behavior that they're just so used to, they don't even know they're doing it. And so sometimes I'll have a you know, conversation with the patient. I'll ask them, well, are you scratching? Are you itching? And they'll say no. And I'm literally watching them do it in front of me. And they'll say, no, I'm not doing it. And that you know, just illustrates how behaviors you know, can, can really get set in in that way. Um, so behavioral modification is an important part of trying to reduce the itch and break the itch scratch cycle. But honestly, for tougher cases, you can do that all day long. And it won't be enough unless you actually try to get rid of the underlying causes of the itch, right? And so, but I think it's important because when we do treat patients, um, sometimes the, you know, for, especially with some of the newer therapies that are a little bit stronger, patients will report major decreases in their itch, but sometimes the, the behavioral change, you know, breaking the itch scratch cycle, that can take a little bit longer. It can lag a little bit more um, until patients really get comfortable and learn what it feels to be like without itch, which is sometimes a tall order for, for tougher cases. Um, but there's definitely a behavioral component that goes to this. And um, we also know that there's situational aspects. Like one of the diagnostic criteria for atopic dermatitis is that itch and the disease in general worsens with emotional factors, right? So when someone has stress, they're going to itch more. And so all of a sudden, the itch can become inherently tied to stressful home or work situations, and then it just becomes this, this very negatively reinforced uh, symptom. Yeah, that's all incredibly important to think about. Is it's, a, it's such a challenging symptom for the community to manage. And one of the questions that we have is, you know, again, coming back to the, you know, how these things can all be interrelated if you're not if you're itching too much, you're not sleeping very well. One of the questions was someone who's had eczema their whole life, and you just mentioned sort of an example of that, and as a result, they've never really slept well or don't feel like they've slept really well. What does that sort of cumulative effect of that poor sleep mean for overall health? Yeah, so there's, there's the cumulative, there's, but even before you start thinking about long-term effects, we know there are very rapid onset short-term effects, particularly when it comes to mood. Uh, the impact on symptoms of anxiety and depression, um, an impact on cognition, cognitive function in general, just memory, concentration, attention. These are all, you know, impacted in a major, major way by sleep deprivation. And there are numerous studies that have been done outside of the world of atopic dermatitis to show what sleep deprivation does across a variety of different settings. And they've all shown a very consistent picture in terms of higher rates of depression, anxiety, ADD, ADHD, cognitive dysfunction, all these things. Recently, the, the world of eczema research has specifically probed that 
and found the exact same story. And so that's not even cumulative. That's like two days in, you know, and um, I mean, I think, you know, I myself have eczema, I can relate. Uh, I don't have it so bad, but I, but I definitely can relate. Um, but, I, you know, I tell when I try to educate other doctors and, and caregivers or family members who don't appreciate or understand just how bad eczema can be for patients, um, I say to them, well, you know, just imagine how you felt after doing a night or two of all nighters studying for finals and how cranky you were. Now, imagine not being able to sleep through no fault of your own for 10 years straight, what that means for patients' mood and, and you know, vitality. So this is something that really can impact all aspects of life. And, uh, and I see one of, the, um, one of the comments just popped up, you know, uh, about the entire family losing sleep. Absolutely. I just had this conversation the other day. If child doesn't sleep, mom doesn't sleep, whole family doesn't sleep, right? So this is a big issue. Um, and it's not just even for kids with parents, it's for adult patients with partners where the partners know sometimes sooner than the patient even recognizes when a flare is coming because they, they feel the scratching waking them up at night. Um, so it's, you know, there's definitely a lot of challenges. Those will happen very quickly. Um, longer term, they're, um, you know, even again, outside the world of atopic dermatitis, there's a whole world of sleep medicine research about what are the harms of chronic sleep deprivation. Uh, some of the common ones have been shown to be um, raising blood pressure, causing weight gain, cardiovascular disease that goes along with some of that. And I know we'll talk about that a little bit more later, but the, uh, this is something that could have, in, and it's not in all patients, we know that it's not in all patients, but in those who really have poor sleep for extended periods, that can be a major driver uh, for some of these downstream comorbidities. Um, even things like injuries and accidents, where you know, I had one day in clinic a few years back um, where two patients no-showed, and another patient um, had no-showed previously came in, and um, I asked why they had missed their previous appointments. And they said, well, uh, because I had, uh, uh, I think for that patient it was, I'd fallen down the stairs and uh, broken my legs. I said, so I was interested, you know, is that the first time? Oh, I'm sorry, take it back, it was a different patient. This patient said, because I'd gotten into a car accident. So I said, you know, is this your first car accident? She said, no, it's my third in a year. So I said, that, that's not a coincidence, how'd that happen? You know, so I asked her about it and she said, well, you know, she gets out from work, you know, sort of what we were talking about earlier, she sits in the car and the itch gets so bad, uh, you know, and I quote, she said, I don't care who's around, I'm going to strip naked and scratch. And if I'm driving and I have to scratch, I got to scratch. And sometimes that means I get distracted and I may even go off the road. I was, I was, I mean, that was like an epiphany, you know, to, to understand like, wow, right? Because when itch hits, it, it's not like it's selective for when you're not driving the car. Um, and those two other patients who no-showed, one was hit by a bus because they were distracted from the itch, and another one fell down the steps because they had so much itch and pain on their feet that they were like wobbling in a funny way so it wouldn't alter the cause more pain, and they fell. And so we, I don't think we take, you know, and fortunately, it's not for all patients, right? And I'm not trying to suggest that these comorbidities are for all patients, but sleep deprivation is actually a big part of that, combined with the, de the, the distraction from itch. So, you know, those are uh, uh, just a few things that have been shown to be related to, uh, to sleep. Uh, and in truth, there's likely a lot more. Yeah, that, that's really um, very sobering, you know, way to, to look at everything. And, and one of the things that you just mentioned was skin pain. Um, and specifically someone who had eczema on their feet, perhaps even just hydrotic eczema. One of the questions that we had was that, um, in addition to the itch, you know, many people also have this skin pain, and that, that's a relatively new understanding within, um, you know, atopic dermatitis and eczema. Can you comment a little bit on that? Sure. So skin pain is a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, th there have been sort of conversations about this very loosely in the atopic dermatitis community, or I don't mean the patient community, I mean the provider community, uh, on and off for, for a while. Um, but we really had no data. And uh, so there, there were, we've, we've actually published recently two separate studies on this, one from a clinical you know, practice type su study, another one from the US population level. And skin pain is really common. 
Um, it's not as common as itch, fortunately, because uh, you know the less we have to deal with other symptoms, the better. But um, it's there. Anywhere between 40 to 60 percent of atopic dermatitis patients will have pain um, from the disease. But it's a very mixed bag, in the sense that for some patients, it's obvious why they have pain. They have these open sores from scratching, and we know what happens when we have cuts on our skin. They hurt. Um, so that's one part of it. But it turns out that that's not actually the majority of cases. Yes, there's some subset that will report pain from their, or at least pain being worsened by some of their skincare products. We know certainly there's a sensitivity issue where uh, certain skincare products are just hard to tolerate. Um, but one of the fascinating things that came out of the research that we recently did was that there's a large subset of patients that in, uh, report this burning um, pain-like soreness that happens as part of just the skin inflammation. And whenever I talk to patients about this, they're like, yeah, sure, of course that's true. Yet for some reason, I don't know, the clinicians didn't pick up on this over the years, or it really wasn't uh, a major issue recognized in clinical practice. And I'm, I'm glad to say that the needle is moving um, and that there are folks who are really starting to pay attention more. It's even starting to become an endpoint in clinical trials. But um, before, you know, four years ago, you, you, you just didn't find skin pain anywhere in the atopic dermatitis literature. So this is a really a revolution of sorts in the field and uh, a long overdue one. And I saw one of the comments just flash on the screen about, you know, uh, uh, someone was saying that their son endorsed skin pain. Yeah, I, when we did the qualitative research, it was pretty much everyone who said at some point they had pain related to their, their atopic dermatitis. But again, I, for whatever reason, it's either it's not the first thing that patients maybe mention to their clinicians, and maybe that's part of it, um, because we always are so trained to talk about the itch aspects. Um, and I would, I would encourage all the eczema patients out there have this conversation with your doctors. I mean, you know, you, they want, if nothing else, so that they understand this is a real thing and that they don't poo-poo it. Uh, but two is that, you know, it, even in how we ask the questions and how we measure things, whether it's in a trial or in clinical practice, um, you know, if you ask someone how their itch is doing and their itch is pretty good, but their pain is terrible, you've just missed a huge, you know, burden to the patient. So I think it's important that clinicians really do ask these questions on a routine basis. And if pain is really high, then that's a reason to step up therapy and to say, hey, we, we haven't gotten adequate control of the disease. We need to do better. Uh, that was the question that I wanted to ask you and follow up, Dr. Silverberg, is, you know, what are the different therapeutic approaches to best manage pain? Is this something that can be handled with sort of over-the-counter medications that we might take for other forms of pain that you experience, or are certain eczema therapies better at managing pain, um, or, or is it sort of the management of the pain sort of a, a correlate of managing other aspects of the disease? So I think the answer is yes to all, but it probably in different subsets of patients. Um, for, for patients where the pain is a direct outcome from scratching and having open sores on the skin, then we would sort of default back to our standard paradigms of get that inflammation under control, get that itch under control, and then the pain will follow in, in terms of its improvement. But as I mentioned, that's not even the majority of patients based on the studies that, that were recently published. Um, and we don't know the answer for those other subsets in the sense that um, certainly, you know, the more severe, the more uncontrolled, the more active someone's skin disease is, the more likely they are to get stinging and burning from personal care products or from topical medications. But sometimes even when patients are pretty clear, they can experience that sensitivity. We don't know what the best way to actually treat that is. Of course, we'll say, use products that are ideal for sensitive skin. But um, sometimes it's a real challenge for patients and we don't know what the best treatment strategies are to offset that. But I think the most unusual or the most uh, new concept that we really don't understand is what do we do about the itch or the, the pain related to the redness, the pain related to the inflammation, which doesn't always come with itch itself. And that is an area that we still don't know enough about. 
We're seeing improvements of pain um, being reported in multiple trials, like in the it wasn't initially what they were thinking about looking at, but they were able to do a so-called post-hoc analysis with the dupilumab study showed benefits. Some of these newer agents under investigation have showed benefits, but, and we're glad to see those benefits, but we also don't know, will any one of those drugs be better than any of the others with respect to, to, uh, to controlling the pain? We also don't know why some patients don't have improvements of their pain. So it, it, it's complex. And I'm glad to see that it's finally on the radars of the medical community. And we're, we're starting to see more research uh, to better understand that. Great. Um, and I, I see that there's some other questions in the chat related to itch, and, and we're gonna try to come back to some of those, but we could probably spend the whole hour talking uh, just about itch, I'm sure. sure. So I wanna maybe move um, to some questions about maybe mental health and, and other uh, related like anxiety and depression that we know many uh, you've already mentioned a lot of patients experience as well and you mentioned the concept of stress earlier and so one of the questions that we had is it seems like the, their eczema is worse when they're stressed out or they're unhappy so even beyond itch is there an actual connection between stress and eczema flares yeah so there are, there are several um, at, at a simple level you know, if we want to tie it back to the itch, we can tie a lot of it back to the itch um, in that, you know, many have described atopic dermatitis or eczema as being the itch that rashes. I, I don't fully agree with that terminology, but it illustrates the point that, you know, it's, there, there's such a strong component of itch in this disease. And then how we react to that will often impact how our skin looks. In other words, the scratching and the thickening and the rubbing. But, you know, that's, that's a more complex topic in of itself. Uh, but if, if stress amplifies itch at that central level, at, at the level of our brain, in the way we literally process that itch and pain information, uh, it amplifies it. And so, you know, the same painful or itchy event, itchy trigger um, in a patient who's totally relaxed after just doing a spa treatment, whatever it might be, their pain level might be a three. Take the exact same itch or pain trigger and put it in someone who is sleep deprived and stressed out, they're gonna report it as a seven or an eight, maybe even more. So it, it's, it's also how it impacts our, uh, you know, how we process that pain and how we perceive that. Um, and the more we itch, of course, the more we're gonna to wanna to alleviate the itch by scratching and then that whole itch scratch cycle can get worse. Uh, but it turns out it's a little bit more complicated than that because there are, we know that uh, even within our body, we have stress responses that happen um, from an endocrine perspective, from a, an immune system perspective. And short term stress is usually a good thing for the body because it alerts the body to take action and, you know, in a sort of a, a teleological way to take action and to uh, eliminate whatever the cause of stress might be, right? So for example, you know, a person has a uh, mosquito uh, biting them actively, then it is good to have itch because you swat the mosquito away and the mosquito stops biting you, right? Mm -hmm. But what often can happen in eczema and other inflammatory diseases is that those signals for itch, those immune signals are just doing it on their own. They're, it's happening under the skin internally, not necessarily even with clear cut outside triggers. And those signals um, are often amplified with stress as well. So the stress cannot just directly impact our perception of itch, it can directly upregulate or increase the inflammation that's happening in our body. And then that's gonna spill over and affect the skin. And for that matter, right, it's, we're talking about eczema, but asthma too, right? This is a similar story where these same kind of immune conversations are relevant to, the, to all of the atopic comorbidities that happen in our atopic dermatitis patients. Yeah, and, and it seems, you know, we're talking about different cycles, you know, sort of the itch scratch, and it seems like, you know, stress, that stress loop may be another sort of perpetuating cycle. And, and one of the questions that we got was um, uh, someone writing that they, they don't want to socialize because they're afraid that their eczema is going to flare. So they're stressed that, you know, about the situation that they're going to experience. Um, so that's one aspect. But then the further is sort of what can you do if you flare when you're out doing some of these activities, you're trying to push past that. 
um, just because you don't want to be, you know, sort of kept in your house and not experiencing life. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, um, I mean, it's a real challenge that comes up. Um, you know, it's, it's, and it's, it's a challenge both for patients. It's a challenge for, for us as clinicians, because, you know, we're, we're, we're almost programmed in our training that for eczema, before we even think of treating patients, we should talk about all of the different, you know, uh, trigger avoidance, you know, and working on avoiding all the different strategies or, or, or all the different potential things that will worsen the disease. And I, you know, I, I was trained in that. And I, of course, think it's important to work on all those medicated, non-medicated strategies. But I also sometimes feel like after I finish having these conversations with patients, I've taken all the fun out of life. And sometimes I think the, uh, our, in, in a, I think a valid attempt to try to improve the itch and reduce flares, we've also taken out all the things that the patients want to do. So this is a, it's a challenging situation that comes up and I think it's a fine balance. Um, you know, I'll have patients say to me, you know, I was very bad. I ate strawberries and, and my eczema flared up. I said, well, you're not a bad person for eating strawberries. Right. You know, but, I, but I feel like we, we have almost programmed patients to feel like, well, you know, if they would just avoid a little bit more, if they would just find that one thing to, to avoid as a trigger, everything would magically go away. And unfortunately it's, it's not that simple for the vast majority of patients. Um, but it's something that um, the coping mechanisms that patients come up with, they may help reduce the itch, but they can take their own toll on patients' lives. And, uh, and I think that's something that we all need to be cognizant of. Uh, if it means that a patient can never go out of their house and never socialize ever again, and that's the only strategy that keeps them from itching, I don't find that as an acceptable solution. At least I'm not going to be the one to suggest that to the patient. And I'm going to say, you know what, I'm going to give you medication here. Because I want you to be able to go out of your house. I want you to be able to socialize and not have to face the anxiety that goes with that. So actually, you know, now that we're, you know, you mentioned the, you know, the anxiety and depression a little bit, uh, sort of what to do when, when you experience uh, those symptoms of anxiety, depression, you know, you see them in your patients or perhaps it's someone that has actually taken some next steps to schedule appointments for either themselves or for their child to see psychotherapists. And we had a few, I saw a question in the chat as well about some teens and, and we have one previously pre-sourced from the community about teens that are going to see psychotherapists. You, can you talk a little bit about, you know, what are other ways to, you know, help teens on that management of that anxiety and depression that might go along with eczema? Okay, so I'm gonna say a few things. I preface by saying that these are controversial, um, not in like a crazy way or anything, but just they're, these are provocative ideas that really need more investigation. Um, one of my treatment goals, particularly for children and adolescents with really tough cases of atopic dermatitis who have um, diagnosis of depression, ADD, ADHD, anxiety, may even be on multiple treatments from a mental health provider for the depression, for the you know anxiety, for the uh, attention deficit disorder. One of my treatment goals is to see if we can get them at least on a lower dose of those medications, possibly even off of those medications, if we can finally achieve tight control of their skin disease. Now, it's not always easy to achieve tight control of the skin disease. We know there's tougher cases, there's unmet needs. We, obviously, that's going to be a subject of a, of a much broader conversation next week. But um, I have had patients, and I'm not saying it's everyone, but I've had patients that where they were being medicated at pretty hefty doses for depression, anxiety, and ADHD at the exact same time. And we finally put them on a strong enough treatment to keep their disease clear and get them at least their itch, maybe not fully clear, but almost clear for uh, a, you know, a nine to 12 month period. And by that point, um, to think of one child in particular, a child was able to finally resume all of their school sports activities and everything they loved doing um, and was off of the Ritalin and was more than 50% down on their antidepressants. So, you know, again, I'm not saying it's everyone and I'm not saying that all mental health issues are coming from eczema, but it is something I think we really need to think about this some of the mental health burden that is happening in atopic dermatitis is not just some loose or cumulative effect of the eczema. It is a direct 
it's almost symptoms. I, I like to refer to this as symptoms of anxiety and depression that are symptoms of atopic dermatitis. And if you can get the atopic dermatitis controlled, you can get those controlled. So I, one of the things I, you know, that I'll stress with parents is the importance of type control is not just how the skin looks um, or their school performance per se, and we should ignore it if they're doing well in school. We really want to get as tight control as possible in order to improve all these other aspects of sleep and mental health. Um, but it, you know, there's still a large subset of patients who will have cumulative of, you know, effects of the eczema leading to mental health issues or just who happen to have mental health issues. We know that you know, uh, they're common everywhere, right? So that's a scenario where um, I think uh, either a multidisciplinary setting or just uh, appropriate access and referral uh, to a mental health specialist. Sometimes that needs to be dealt with behaviorally. Sometimes it needs to be even dealt with pharmacologically. Um, you know, almost always the, the recommendations will be to start with behavioral interventions. I think some of the uh, social support groups, even like some of the, the, uh, the NIA support groups are really a wonderful opportunity for patients to just sort of vent and discuss and, and can be cathartic for patients. Um, so, so there's a lot of different, uh, you know, behavioral techniques that can be used to improve some of that. Uh, but sometimes it means working together with other providers to uh, tweak, so to speak, the mental health issues pharmacologically as well. Great. And, and related to that, I saw a question previously in the chat, as long as we're talking about, you know, teens on some level, there was uh, the mention of perhaps someone who's maybe more resistant to advice, you know, in terms of what to best do. Have you encountered that? And what might your recommendations be for a parent who's struggling with that? Yeah, go figure that teens might not listen to all the instructions from grownups. <laughs> Who would have thunk it? Um, it is definitely a challenge. Um, it really is. I think, you know, and, and we've learned in medicine in general that adolescent health is, is a, you know, a beast of its own. It's completely different than when you're dealing with younger kids and young adults and, and older adults. Um, the you know, this is where I think sometimes pediatric dermatologists can be sometimes most helpful, but dealing with folks who have a really a pediatric background and comfortability dealing with, with uh, children and adolescents can be very helpful uh, because there are certain, you know, just um, educational techniques to engage. But it is a particularly tough age group because, you know, as a parent, you can slather on the moisturizer and the topicals and whatever else might be when they're younger. Uh, and as an adult, hopefully they'll be responsible and do it on their own, but it's this in-between period where it is definitely a challenge. Um, I think you know, it has to be part of the shared decision-making the same way it is for any other patient. They have to be part of that and not only part of it, they have to be the main uh, you know, participants with the clinician for a shared decision-making conversation where they're gonna be able to say, you know what, I know my mom thinks I, I should do the shot, but just heck no, I'm not doing a shot. I'm, and, and you could prescribe it, but I'm not gonna use it. Well, then we have, to, we have to count for that. And even though we may think the shot is the best treatment for them, we may have to find another option because you know, I, as I tell to my residents, I can prescribe any treatment in the world, but if my patient's not gonna use it, it's worthless. So we have to try to find, and we also have to work on strategies to improve uh, adherence in terms of usage of medication. You know, I, I almost never recommend twice daily of any medication because I am, I personally am the worst patient in the world. I can't remember to take something twice daily. How can I force that on my patients and especially on adolescents who, whose schedule is already inconsistent? Um, so working on once daily treatments, maybe even trying to use something that's a little bit more potent, but used a little less regularly. There are simple strategies that can be done to sort of improve uh, the outcomes with topical therapies, um, but elegance, tolerability of, of, of things. You know, often I, I will push ointments as the, our guidelines encourage because of their better efficacy than creams or lotions. But you know what? For a self-conscious teenager, they don't want anything greasy on their face or on their skin, you know, and what others might see. So, you know, we can work around some of those things, but it's really about understanding the priorities of the adolescent and taking them into account and trying to problem solve and find the best solutions to, to accommodate. Right. Yeah, very, very, very challenging. 
Um, so now I want to pivot us a little bit to perhaps maybe some of the lesser talked about um, things that go along with eczema. Um, let's talk first about infections. We had a couple of questions about, you know, why are people with eczema more likely to have MRSA infections as an example, and what can you do if you think you have it? And maybe then as a follow-up, let's talk about something like eczema herpeticum, you know, kind of sure. taking bacterial and viral in the same kind of thinking. Yeah, so this is an area where we actually know a lot um, about the, the connections. And it turns out it's not just one connection. There's at least a dozen connections. I'm not going to mention all of them just for the sake of time, but at a simple level, when the skin barrier is broken down with eczema, um, that, you know, the job of the, of our skin is to keep the outside world out. And that includes all, all kinds of different bacteria, viruses, etc. And when that barrier is compromised, those bugs are able to get in and they can seed into the skin, they can cause infections of the skin, they can cause, they can even get into the bloodstream rarely and cause systemic infections at times. Um, so, you know, this is one of the reasons why we really aim to achieve good control and, and, and improving the skin barrier. But it's not all just barrier. The inflammation itself has direct effects where we, we have certain things called antimicrobial peptides on our skin that are these little chemicals, if you will, that are natural, that are there to fight and prevent infections. And uh, with all the inflammation that happens in eczema, we lose those. And so we, you know, there's multiple aspects. And then we get this big spike and, and uh, overgrowth of staph aureus bacteria on our skin that crowds out all the other good bacteria. And all of a sudden we have this recipe for uh, you know, we have this increased so-called colonization of more staff living on our skin, broken down skin barrier, immune system is not functioning the way it should, and it's, a, it's just a recipe, unfortunately, for getting infections. Um, and it turns out, and, and as you alluded in the question, it's not just bacterial skin infections. Uh, it's a whole variety of infections that happen, viral infections, yeast infections, fungal infections, depending on the age group, the location on the body, et cetera. And even the time of year varies in terms of what types of infections will occur. Eczema herpeticum is, um, you know, is, a, is sort of one of the most advanced infections that can happen on the skin in atopic dermatitis. Uh, we know that um, children and adults with atopic dermatitis have higher rates of herpes virus infections in general. Well, what does that mean? So things like cold sores, for example. Uh, now, a localized cold sore may be a nuisance, maybe are uncomfortable. Uh, but it shouldn't be life-threatening in of itself. But with eczema herpeticum, it's essentially where the virus can now spread to a much larger area. Uh, and it's not just localized to one area, but it can, it can be a whole face, it can be a whole body sometimes. In children, it, it's, a, it's still a scary infection, and we need to treat that. And it sometimes can come along with, with bacterial infections at the same time. Um, but in adults, it can be particularly scary because an older adult who gets eczema herpeticum, it can be life-threatening in those situations. And, and we need to hospitalize and think about IV medications to treat it. Uh, so what's fascinating is that we're seeing more and more now from our clinical trials research that it almost doesn't make a difference what medication is being used if you can successfully get the eczema better. Um, and get the barrier improved, get the inflammation improved, you can actually drop the risk of bacterial skin infections enormously. Even for medications that are considered to be immunosuppressants, you would think they're, they should increase the risk of infection. But in fact, the net gain of making the skin and the, and the eczema and the inflammation better is such that it actually reduces the, the, you know, the risk of certain skin infections. So this is now becoming... Um, an important conversation as we think about a lot of different new medications coming out. Some of them are actually reducing the risk of infection. So not only are we not seeing infection as a, as a side effect, we're actually seeing it as a benefit that it's able to, to improve infections in some scenarios because that is the value of getting eczema under tighter control. That's really interesting. And so in terms of, you know, the advice for people to, you know, help prevent infections, you know, obviously that's, you know, working with your doctor to, you know, pick the best medication and the best strategies that will help you manage your overall eczema. But then it sounds like, you know, using strategies that will help really maintain that barrier as effective as possible. You know, is there any other practical guidance that you give your patients in general, you know, to 
either help reduce the colonization of staff on a regular basis? How do you how do you talk about that? Yeah, so, um, you know, again, my first priority will be to try to achieve tighter control as much as possible. And with that, that's, you know, one of the important things we think about is the idea of using um, proactive therapy with topicals and or with, uh, you know, systemic medications. The idea of we use whatever the dose we are supposed to be using to treat a flare, but sometimes, let's say a topical steroid once a day or twice a day during a flare, but between flares, we can use the topical steroids once or twice a week as a prevention approach. And that, you know, you, you have to talk to your doctor if that's the right approach for you, but for many patients with chronic disease, that is a great option to think about. Um, but by doing that, we can also just sort of maintain homeostasis, you know, just keep things pretty stable. And that has, um, you know, the, the downstream benefits of also reducing uh, infections. Um, there's a lot of controversy right now about what role bleach baths should or shouldn't play in this particular uh, respect. Um, some are big believers in it, some less so. One thing that is very clear though, is that whether or not bleach does anything is, is still debatable and the evidence suggests that it really doesn't do so much, but taking a bath by itself can be helpful. And I think this is a very provocative idea, but very well supported by the data, that just taking regular baths, um, not avoiding the baths, like they used to tell everyone 30 years ago, stay out of the bath, that was just, the data show that that's not ideal, it's not good recommendation for patients. But taking a bath, even with just, you know, without using just straight water, nothing else, is enough to really wash off a lot of that staph bacteria, wash away a lot of the crustiness and oozing that can happen on the skin, it allows the, the water to really you know, penetrate into the skin. And if it's followed, the key thing is to follow the bath with the application of topical therapies or moisturizers to seal that moisture in. That um, is actually an incredibly effective strategy. We call that the soak and smear approach, but is incredibly effective at reducing uh, colonization. Multiple studies have shown this and reducing risk of skin infections. And so I almost never recommend bleach baths to my patients, but I always recommend the soak and smears, just doing plain water baths. And I think I've had to prescribe an antibiotic for a patient with eczema maybe twice in seven years. So that's, and that's an unusual statistic for, for docs who see tough cases of eczema because usually we're thinking of using lots of antibiotics. Uh, and I really try to keep patients off of antibiotics as much as possible just because of the concerns about resistance and everything else. So we, it's ideal to really try to do this without antibiotics. There's also now uh, uh, several different products out there, whether over-the-counter or prescription devices, that are these antiseptic products that are designed uh, to help reduce some of the colonization and potentially treat uh, su uh, superficial skin infections. And they probably all or most of them have value. Um, in that respect, I think the one thing that I have concern about is we recently published a study um, a few years ago looking at what eczema patients tend to develop skin allergies to. And three of the more common allergens that they developed uh, allergies to were bacitracin, neosporin, and chlorhexidine, or, or hibiclens is the, the brand name that they sell as a, as a rinse for antiseptics. And it's clear that a lot of these medications that we might use as antiseptics can potentially come with side effects too, and folks can develop allergies to them over time. So I try to find the non-medicated strategies wherever possible. Great. And then moving off of infections, we had a couple of questions about um, eye diseases, like a, an eye condition uh, called keratoconus and, and cardiac disease. I was just wondering if you could talk about you know, heart conditions that might come along with atopic dermatitis and, and what we know about eye conditions as well. Sure. So for the eye conditions, not only is this not surprising, it's one of the diagnostic criteria for atopic dermatitis. It's one of the so-called minor criteria that patients with atopic dermatitis have a, a higher rates of a variety of different eye issues. Um, conjunctivitis, you know, hay fever, could be seasonal allergies that manifest in the eyes. Um, there's something called atopic keratoconjunctivitis, which is sort of a distinct entity that happens quite commonly in patients. Well, relatively speaking commonly, it's a common cause amongst those who get eye issues within atopic dermatitis. Um, and then keratoconus can as well. 
And there's, these are complex, right? These are complex sometimes from a combination of the systemic inflammation that happens in the disease. Uh, we've seen uh, from some of our own internal research that probably the strongest predictor of uh, atopic carotid conjunctivitis is the, the eosinophil counts in the blood, uh, which is, you know, a measure sort of a systemic inflammation. Some of it is from chronic rubbing of the eyes. That can happen when patients get eczema on the eyelids or around the eyes um, or uncontrolled allergies that drive it. Um, and so, so, you know, sometimes it's even from the medications where, you know, for folks who are really using uh, very high doses of uh, and long-term doses of systemic steroids in particular, like the prednisones and stuff like that, uh, have higher rates of getting, um, you know, cataracts, glaucoma, uh, and, you know, as, as other eye issues. So it's, it's, it's definitely a mix. Um, and this is one where there really needs to be just a lot more education and, and interdisciplinary crosstalk between the eye world and the skin world. Because I can tell you, having gone through medical school, I have no idea what my ophthalmology colleagues are writing in their notes. They use these, these two letter, if you ever see an ophthalmology note, it's like a foreign, like Morse code. It's impossible to understand what they're saying. It's a, just a whole different language. But you know, for the atopic dermatitis patient that can have these other effects that happen beyond the skin, we really need to have more of that interdisciplinary crosstalk. Um, now the cardio, uh, cardiovascular cardiac issues are a relatively newly discovered one. Um, I think uh, our research group was actually the first group to publish on this issue uh, back in 2015. We, there were already multiple studies that had looked at uh, higher rates of obesity, but we had shown higher rates of hypertension, diabetes, prediabetes, high cholesterol, and even cardiovascular disease and, and congestive heart failure. Now, the good news is, if there, because that sounds really scary and like, oh my gosh, but the good news is it is not even close to the majority. We're talking about only a small subset, fortunately, who get this. I, I wish nobody got it, but um, it's not like every patient is going to get it. But what we did see was it tends to be the most, most severe ones. And coming back to what we talked about earlier, it tends to be the ones who have the really the prolonged and really uh, severe sleep disturbances and deprivation. That appears to really be an important risk factor for getting that. So all the more reason for us to really try to work on getting good sleep um, for our patients, both short-term and long-term. Um, in terms of whether or not any treatments will improve the, uh, the cardiac risk, we don't know yet. I mean, it's so new to us that we're, we're just in the very early stages of research. But there are many groups that are starting to look at this. Uh, we've had a lot of researchers studying this in the world of psoriasis, which is a different skin disease, and shown some fascinating relationships as well. And that medications can sometimes, when they control the psoriasis, they can improve the cardiovascular disease. Hopefully, we'll have a similar situation here. We don't know yet, though. It's still a little early, but stay tuned, and we'll have a lot more to talk about over the next few years. Great, and I see we're getting close to time. So I'm gonna ask one final question of you, Dr. Silverberg, and then if we have a moment, I'll switch back to see if there's anything else in the chat. So those of you on the line, go ahead and put any final questions that you might have in the chat. But I think what you have alluded to throughout our conversation today, Dr. Silverberg, is just how complex a disease eczema is and, and how severe it can be for a number of people. And one of the questions that came in was, it was specifically related to COVID and starting new jobs and, and having to you know, be on Zoom and explain to people that aren't familiar with you, don't know you, don't know your disease, um, sort of what it's like for you and that you might have days where you can be on camera or not be on camera or even people that are, are more in person in their jobs. You know, how, how does someone go about explaining the, you know, what eczema is to someone who doesn't, and this potential severity of it, who doesn't really have the same uh, shared experience as you. Yeah, I, I don't know if we have enough time to cover this one fully and do it justice, but I think I can just, you know, give a few of my own sort of pearls or anecdotes on this. I think the first thing is to stop using the term eczema. Now, I'm not against using the term eczema, but in this conversation, it's, you have to say, I have atopic dermatitis. Uh, it, you know, because when people hear eczema, they think, oh, I, I once had a niece 
who had a little patch in their skin fold for like three weeks in their, as a kid, and now they're, they don't have any more as an adult. And that's what, it's just the way our minds work, right? It's just how they associate things. But atopic dermatitis is a chronic inflammatory skin disease. And I think that's the conversation that you have to start with. And, and, uh, and if it's more severe, to be able to say, I have moderate or I have severe atopic dermatitis. Um, and what that comes with, and in terms of everything we've talked about, the intense itch, the pain, the sleep disturbances, all those other things that can lead to functional impacts. Now that's a little less of an issue with respect to being on camera and a little bit more about being able to have good work productivity. Um, you know, but the, uh, you know, when patients are so distracted and they're not concentrating, they're not able to do the job that they want to do at work. But being on camera, for those patients particularly who have um, atopic dermatitis affecting the head and neck area, um, that, that, you know, the employer needs to recognize that uh, this is something that, while it's usually not the first complaint of the atopic dermatitis patient, but it can be cosmetically very unsightly at times, um, and uh, that, you know, that can impact the ability to conduct face-to-face -face interviews or something along those lines. So, you know, it's, it's always a challenge. Um, and, you know, the, the workplace r rules and regulations are in the U.S. are not quite as um, uh, favorable to patients as it is in certain, let's say, European countries, just as an example. So it's, it's, it's about just, I think, having an open conversation, finding an understanding boss, which, you know, I, I don't know if I have great advice on how to do that, but, um, but it's something that, you know, there's educational resources out there. I have had uh, permission granted from patients at times to talk directly to their employer, whether that was on paper with uh, forms explaining the whole story or literally uh, a phone call conversation with this. Um, and so, you know, it's, there's, and sometimes when it's disruptive of work, sometimes patients even have to go on disability short term to address it. Um, I, I think it's just, you know, it's just about education. Most of the time, I don't think employers are trying to be jerks. I think they're just ignorant and they don't understand what the disease can do. And hopefully with an honest conversation, um, you know, that, that they will, uh, you know, deal with it appropriately and give the appropriate flexibility and leeway to their employees. Great. So, and thank you. So thank you for all of those answers. And, and thank you to everyone who put the questions in the chat. I think, unfortunately, we have run out of time, but I wish we could get to everyone's question. Um, so I, I think we're unfortunately out of time today, but I want to thank you so much, Dr. Silverberg, for joining us and for all the work that you do uh, for people with eczema and perhaps I should say for atopic dermatitis now in light of your last <laughs> uh, So, and, and thank you to all who joined us today. We hope to see you again tomorrow at 3 p.m. Pacific time uh, when community members Lynette and Sean will host the It's Factor, a talent show intended to show that people with eczema are so much more than their skin. Uh, you can learn more and get the Zoom link for that meetup and for all things Eczema Awareness Month at visiting, by visiting eczemamonth.org. Uh, so thank you again to the sponsors who made this event possible. Um, and I wish everyone has a great day.